They're small, they're easy to work with, and we can put them into bacteria very easily. I could teach each of you how to put a plasmid into bacterium, and we could all do one in this class uh, in the matter of a few minutes and see the results tomorrow. Okay? It's a very, very simple technique to do that. Now, what do we care about that? Well, what we care about that is um, we would like to be able to, for example, say, I've isolated a human gene. I would like for the bacterium to make a lot of copies of that gene and start synthesizing that protein. Let's say I am interested in human growth hormone. Or let's say I'm interested in a blood clotting factor. Okay? Before the advent of modern biotechnology, the only way that those things were available was by either isolating it from gallons, thousands of gallons of human blood, which is not really a practical thing, which made their expense absolutely enormous, or they were isolated from related organisms like cows. And they're not exactly the same as ours is. For diabetics, this was a particular issue because they were relying on insulin coming from another source. Type 1 diabetics can't make their own insulin. So cow insulin was used. And people who had type 1 diabetes over a long period of time started developing antibodies against the cow insulin because the body saw it as foreign. That's a problem. Well, what if you had a bacterium make human insulin or human growth hormone or human whatever it was that you needed? It's very cheap to grow up, okay? It's not going to be recognized as foreign. You've got the perfect um, um, uh, drug, as it were, okay? And that's exactly what we do. So I'm going to tell you a, basic, a very simple scheme for doing that. It starts with the plasmid. The plasmid has the following characteristics in order for us to accomplish this. It has the characteristic that it has a unique restriction site that I can cut. So this might be, let's say, an EcoR1 site that I can cut. That's important because I'm going to be putting something into there. If I can't cut it, then I can't make it be linear. I can't insert the thing. Okay? So I make my cut. That cut, ideally, is positioned in front of a promoter. So if we look on the left here, let's say I've got a little promoter right there. I take my gene of interest and cut it with the same enzyme. I cut it with EcoR1. It turns out these ends will stick together very nicely if I do that. And when they stick together, I can use a DNA ligase. What does DNA ligase do? It's going to join fragments together. What kind of bonds does it make? Phosphodiester bonds, good, okay? Makes phosphodiester bonds, and now it's all linked together. The plasmid has one other characteristic, okay? The plasmid contains, or two other characteristics. One is that it contains a replication origin. That's important because we want the plasmid to replicate in the bacteria. If it doesn't have a replication origin, we can put it in bacteria, but it's not going to do anything when that bacterium divides. It's got a replication origin. And the last thing it has is a way of selecting for the bacteria that get the plasmid. I need to explain that to you. It has a gene in there that allows us to select for the bacteria that get the plasmid. The gene that's used is a resistance to an antibiotic. So it might be resistance to ampicillin. That's a very common one that's used in the laboratory. Well, why do I have to have that on the plasmid? It turns out that our way of putting the plasmid into bacteria is very inefficient. Even though it's easy to do, at best I can get about one plasmid per every 10,000 to a million bacteria. All I care about are the bacteria that get the plasmid. So if I do that technique where I put this plasmid into those bacteria and then I treat the bacteria with ampicillin, the only ones that will live will be those that have my plasmid. Now, if the promoter is very active, guess what's going to happen? The bacteria are going to start making the gene that I put into them. They're going to make insulin. They're going to make um, uh, human growth hormone. Whatever that gene is, they're going to make it because they use the same genetic code that we do. Okay? 
The genetic code is universal. As a consequence, modern biotechnology uh, has available to us all kinds of human proteins that would otherwise not be available. Okay? The lives of people who have uh, deficiencies in clotting factors have been changed immensely because of just this right here. It used to be they were isolated from human blood. And in many cases, when the HIV uh, epidemic came about, many people with, um, hemoph with hemophilia um, developed um, the um, HIV as a consequence of the virus they got through those, those isolations. That's not a factor anymore. So pretty cool. OK, questions on that? Have we got it figured out? Should we call it a day? What's that? I'm sorry, there's one question. That's fine. One question. Can you use that technique to stop cancer cells? The answer is, in general, no. Okay? Uh, you can certainly make things that will stop cancer cells, but the problem is that you've got many, many different types of cancers. So that you, though you might be able to design or find a protein that might target one cancer cell, there's many others that it would not. Okay, an early one today. Let you guys be. See you at the exam tomorrow. I'll be in my office tomorrow if you have questions. How you doing, Amanda? Good. Um, I just came across a quick question while I was studying. I was kind of confused about um, the DNA polymerases, the three different ones in E. coli. Yep. Which one does which? I know that polymerase okay. 3 makes most of it, and then polymerase 1 does the 5 prime, the 3 prime. Mm -hmm. What does polymerase 2 do? Okay. So all the polymerases work 5 prime to 3 prime. Right. Okay. So polymerase 3 makes the majority of the bacterial genome. Okay. Polymerase 1 largely takes care of the Okazaki fragments. Right. Okay. okay. And polymerase two is mostly used for repair. We haven't really talked about it, but it's it's not a very important polymerase in the in the bigger scheme. Okay. So it's used yeah, just... where there's damage to DNA. So some of the repair systems actually use polymerase two. Does that one do the repair like if it made a mistake in the um, putting in the different? No. It so doesn't. mistakes. So it's one. Mistakes are well. It, it, so mistakes. It, it depends on the nature of the mistake. Okay. So all three polymerases can catch mistakes as they're doing them. That's proofreading. Okay. So all three of them have a three prime to five prime uh, exonuclease. Okay. So they, they make a mistake. They'll catch it while they're doing it. If there are mistakes that make it in and don't get proofread, then different repair systems, which may involve polymerase too, get, get involved. Oh, uh, okay. So Makes sense? Different circumstances. That... Right. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yep. Study hard.